seconds. another two on the M chorus and then <laughs> all right give people I'll give them another minute just in case but that's as long as I'll give them <sighs> so last lecture we looked at um, system level timing so that was looking at our setup and hold time constraints um, in the uh, context of a system where you've got some registers and some combinational logic between them and we needed to make sure that the setup and hold time was uh, maintained passing between those two registers through the combinational logic but possibly also looping back round onto a register through some combinational logic. Um, so last lecture we were looking at how the um, clock skew affected the hold time and the setup time. Um, so we saw that the as we increase the clock skew going from the earlier register to the later register, we saw that it makes it much easier to satisfy our setup time constraints because we've got longer to make our data valid. However, it makes it harder to satisfy our hold time constraint because as we increase our skew, the amount of time we need to keep our data stable for becomes longer. Conversely, if we um, reduce the skew, even so far as making it negative, by making a longer delay to the clock input on the um, former register, um, we can make it easier to satisfy our hold time constraints at the expense of making it harder to satisfy our setup time constraints um, and possibly even affecting our um, maximum clock frequency. Um, 
So we saw we can adjust our skew, and then we saw if we've got um, violations on both our setup and our hold times, we need to adjust our skew um, so that we, or the delay of our combinational logic, so that we um, meet the hold time constraint because that one's the harder constraint to meet because it's got less less things that we can adjust. And then once we've met our hold time constraint, we can then adjust our clock frequency to modify our um, um, to meet our setup time constraint. However, what happens if we're not able to modify our clock frequency? So imagine we have some inputs coming in every 10 minute, um, 10 nanoseconds. It's no good if our logic um, has a max, uh, a minimum clock period of 40 nanoseconds. We need to get data in every 10, 10 nanoseconds. And so we need another technique to try and reduce our um, clock period, increase our clock frequency, and that's why we're looking at pipelining. Right, that's working. So, looking at pipelining, before we look at pipelining in the context of the circuit, first we're going to look at laundry. Um, so, um, just checking that is working, that's working, yeah, right. Um, so, how do you do laundry? Um, I've been locked up inside because of coronavirus, um, so I've accumulated three months of laundry. Um, I need to get all this laundry done, it's going to take, I've got a lot of it to do, um, it's probably going to take quite a while, um, how am I going to do it? So let's look. So our input, we've got some dirty laundry, three months of it. Right? Then we've got some processes. We've got a washer, which fills up, agitates the laundry, and then spins the water out. And then the time the, take, the washer takes to process the laundry, the propagation delay of the washer is 45 minutes. We've got another process, a device called a dryer, right? The dryer heats our washing up and spins it round. The time it takes for the dryer to operate, its propagation delay is 60 minutes. And then our output is six weeks worth of clean clothing um, to get us a bit through, further through the lockdown. So the very simple way we could do this is to is the one load at a time process. Why are we saying okay? I'll we'll take our dirty laundry. We'll put it into the washer. We'll wait for the washer to do its thing. We'll then take it out of the washer, put it in the dryer, wait for the dryer to do its thing, and then we'll take it out. Right? Propagation delay of this whole um, process is the propagation delay of the washer, so this bit here, plus the propagation delay of the dryer, this bit here, which is 45 plus 60, 105 minutes. Doing one load at a time is not smart because we've got the overhead of we have to go um, take our dirty washing, go to the laundry room, find some detergent, Take it, move it between the two, take it out the launching, laundry room and go back. So we're going to do a few loads of laundry at once, right? We're going to do end loads. So we're going to start off by putting our first input, I1, into our washer and let it spin. Then we're going to take load one, um, input one, and put it into the dryer and let it spin. And then we take it out and we put our next load in, input two. We wait for it to do its thing in the washer. We move it to the dryer. We wait for it for, to do its thing in the dryer. We take it out, O1, O2, output one, output two. How long must you wait for all these loads well, it's going to be however many loads you've got, 
times this plus this. So N times the propagation delay of the washer plus the propagation delay of the dryer, which is N times 105 minutes. So for my three months of laundry, right, it's going to take two loads, 210 minutes, right? Is there a better way we can do this? We're going to do it the VLSI way. We're going to put our first load of laundry in the washer and we're going to wait for it to spin. So far so good. Then we're going to take that load of laundry and put it in the dryer but while that's spinning we're going to put our next load of laundry into the washer and let that spin as well. Once this one's done and it comes out, O1, we take I2, we put it into the dryer, let that spin, and we put I3, our third load, into the washer and let that spin as well. Eventually that um, dryer finishes, we get our output 2, we move input 3 over to the dryer, let it spin, Put input 4 in, let that spin, eventually this one comes out, we get output 3, and we keep going ad infinitum. How much, how long do you need to wait for all the loads to complete? Well, every time, so our dryer is always going, right? So every 60 minutes, this dryer finishes a load and gives us one load of output. So this one takes 60 mins. Each of these, let's not put it here. So from here to here, 60 minutes, 60 minutes, 60 minutes. Right, it's going to be however many loads you've got times the maximum out of the propagation delay of the washer and the propagation delay of the dryer, which is going to be n times 60 minutes for two loads. That would just be 120 minutes. Compared to the 210 minutes I had for um, the one step at a time. That's not 100% true. We haven't really um, thought about our setup time just here. So we've actually got a shorter setup time of 45 minutes, right? So actually, it's n times 60 plus another 45 because right at the start, you need to set it up by putting one load only into the washer and not into the dryer. So it's n times 60 plus 45. So, in fact, it's not quite 120 minutes, it's actually 165 minutes. Still faster, just not quite as fast as we'd hoped. However, what we're concerned with when doing things the VLSI way is what happens when we've got a large N. What happens as N tends to infinity of our propagation delay divided by the number of items and that will be equal to the max propagation delay. Okay, so when we're looking at things the VLSI way, unfortunately we do have this annoying setup time so if you've only got a small amount of data to process, a small amount of washing to do, maybe it's not amazingly efficient to do it this way. But when you've got lots and lots of work to do, it's much faster to do things this way. Um, you'll probably have seen this with the, um, with the production line as well. It's not efficient to have 
one car, go through the entire production line, and then start the next car. It's much more efficient to have one car at each stage of your production line than it is to have the um, than to have um, only one one car in the production line at once. So um, we've seen that for our specific scenario here, um, we reckon that doing it the VLSI way is faster. But we want to make this um, very, like, we want to quantize this. We want to define some performance metrics, which allows us to say it is this much better. So our performance measures, um, we've got two of them. First one is latency. So that is the delay from when we give it an input. To when it gives us the corresponding output. So we give it an input, I1. After the latency, it is, it'll give us our output, O1. We give it the input, I2. After the latency, it'll give us the O2 output. For normal laundry, the latency is 105, 105 minutes. We do our drying, then our washing, which is 45 plus 60, 105 minutes. For our VLSI laundry, it's a bit different. When we look at our um, pipeline, what we see is that we put our I2 in at the same time as we move our I1 over to our dryer. And then this runs for 45 minutes. But after 45 minutes, this still has 15 minutes left. And so the I2 laundry sitting here has to sit here for another 15 minutes until, this, um, until I1 is done in the dryer before it can be moved over, right? So we see that we spend 45 minutes in here being washed and then we've got an extra 15 minutes latency before we can move over to the dryer and to be done, right? So with VLSI laundry, it's 120 minutes. We spend 45 minutes in the dryer. We then spend 15, uh, sorry, in the washer. 15 minutes wait, and then 60 minutes in the dryer, totaling 120 minutes. Right, um, so that just says, assuming that you start your um, wet, um, starts drying your wet laundry the moment that um, the um, dryer unit is available, right? So here, we're worse off. The time between get, putting one item in and getting it out is worse. So if we're only doing one item, do it the normal way. Throughput, the rate at which imports or outputs are processed. So that is, we've got I1 and that produces O1. We've got I2 and that produces O2. Got I3, that produces O3. The time between these outputs is the throughput. Okay? For normal laundry, we get one load every 105 minutes. So that's about 1.7 loads every three hours. For our VLSI laundry, if we look back at our um, diagram, we see that we get one load out every 60 minutes, not every 105 minutes. They may be spend, each load spends 120 minutes in the laundrette, but we get one load out of it every 60 minutes. This is much better. 
So if you've got a large amount of laundry, in fact, anything above um, two loads, you're better off um, doing it the VLSI way. So now we're experts in uh, doing laundry efficiently. Um, let's go actually have a look at some circuits. So here we've got a relatively simple circuit. We've got three, comp three combinational components. I'm going to make that clear. Combinational, combinational. And then we've got a timing diagram down here. So we've got A of X, B of X. That didn't look much like a B, did it? And then C of X is over here, right? So this is node two, node three, and node four, right? So we see from our X input becoming valid at T1, so X becomes valid at T1. It takes 15 time units. That could be nanoseconds, it could be picoseconds, it could be seconds, I don't know. Um, depends on what type of logic we've got. Um, but it takes 15 time units for A of X to become valid. So valid at um, T2, which equals T1 plus 50. Conversely, B becomes valid after 20 time units to T3, right? Valid at T3, which equals T1 plus 20. Notice how both A and B are defined relative to T1 because the input X becomes valid at T1 so their outputs will be T1 plus some time. C, well, its A input is valid at 15 nanoseconds. Its B input is valid at 20 nanoseconds. I'm just going to say nanoseconds here because it's easier. So C, its output can only start to transition to the valid um, to a valid value um, after. Um, the latest of its inputs. So C is going to be valid at max of T2 and T3 plus, and then the delay of it, 25 nanoseconds, which equals Uh, so that will be T3 plus 25 nanoseconds. Okay, so we say, what is the latest input that becomes available to our combinational logic? And then what is the delay of our combinational logic? We add them together and that gives us the time at which our output becomes valid. Right? For a set of purely combinational logic, we've got our latency, which is just the um, total propagation delay and we've got our throughput which is 1 divided by our propagation delay it's only once RC of X becomes valid that we can start to change um, X to a new data value and get a new piece of data through there the data can't go through this circuit any faster no matter what there will always be this critical path through B to C which will take at least, at the very least, 45 nanoseconds. We can't get it any faster, but are we making effective use of all our hardware at all times? Well, obviously not. We compute the um, outputs A of X and B of X, and then the A and B units are just sitting there doing nothing while the C unit is calculating its output, C of X. Conversely, while we're calculating A of X and B of X, C is sat there effectively doing nothing, waiting for A and B to do their calculations. Can we make this better? Can we make this our washer? And this our dryer? And find a way to make sure that we're using both our washer 
and our dryer at the same time? We can. Let's put some registers in there, right? What we're going to do is we're going to put registers at the A of X and the B of X points. This will hold the input to C stable so that A and B can be working on a different um, input while C is working on its inputs, right? We'll assume that these registers at the moment are ideal. So that means TSU equals zero, TH equals zero, and TCQ equals TCD reg, which equals zero. As much as real registers aren't like this, this is an ideal register, sometimes it's good, um, It's a very good thing to model registers this way, rather than dealing with the complexities of the register inside the register itself. What you can do is you can amortize um, the delays in the register and you can move the setup time into the accompanying logic. And say, same thing with the CQ and the CD, right? Sometimes it's easier to just model your register as a ideal register and then move your setup hold and, hold and propagation delay constraints into the uh, surrounding logic. Um, it makes answering some questions a bit easier. Um, and some tools prefer to work this way. I've got a question from someone. What's this? What are the first two time? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what you're on about there, Siran. Um, could you elaborate? Um, tau and T N. Oh, T S U. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Maybe I didn't. That wasn't clear. That's the setup time of the register. This is the hold time of the register. So these are the values we saw in our system level timing and our sequential lectures. This is the clock to output propagation delay. And then that one is the clock to output contamination. Delay. Right. Um, can I explain why they are all zero? Yes, um, we're assuming that these are um, ideal registers. We don't want to deal with the complexities of a real register at the moment. So we're just going to say this is an ideal register. Um, and we'll just look at it like that. And for an ideal register, it's got zero setup and hold times and propagation delays. Um, so, yeah, we're just saying assume it's an ideal register. Um, obviously, in real logic, we would have to deal with the um, nastiness of a real register, but we can deal with that later. Um, we just want to say, imagine we've got a perfect holding element there, and let's see what happens. Okay? So, zero delay, ideal registers, and our TPD values are as shown. So, these are the TPD values. 15, 20, and 25, as we saw on the previous slide. If we don't add in these registers and we don't pipeline it, our latency is 45, because we've got 45 nanoseconds to get to the output, and our throughput, obviously, is 1 by 45. We can only make a new piece of data, um, put a new piece of data in, after C of X becomes valid, so we can only do one every 45 nanoseconds. However, with a two-stage pipeline, which is what we've got here, I'm just going to remove these momentarily. So 
so that you can see this. Um, we've created something called a two-stage pipeline because we put um, data in on clock cycle I and data becomes available on clock cycle I plus 2. Data becomes available here at clock cycle I plus 1. Right? So this is a two-stage pipeline. One stage, two stage. Stage 1, stage 2. Try that one again. Right? So this is a two-stage pipeline. The latency to get through it is 50, right? Because this stage here requires um, a clock frequency of 25 time units, we can't run our clock any faster, and so the latency will be two stages times our clock frequency of 25, which is 50. So that's 25 times 2, right? Our throughput, on the other hand, because we can um, output one piece of data every 25 nanoseconds, because C is always working on a piece of data, which is the data processed the previous cycle by A and B, our throughput is 1 by 25, which equals 1 by T, C, L, K. So I'll also put that's T, C, L, K times K. K is the number of stages in our pipeline. Our latency is slightly worse. An extra 11% latency. Our throughput, on the other, other hand, is much better. That is minus 45.45% um, or actually, where's the better way to put it? You get Nine fifths, which equals uh, one point eight times the throughput. Right, we've almost doubled our throughput, and we added on eleven percent latency. Little bit worse, much better. Okay. So, I would have thought that the, oh right, okay, for some reason that's afterwards. Um, I would have put this later on, I should do that next time. Um, right, so this is something called a pipeline diagram. Um, oh yes, Siran. Um, Hi Scott, um, can I ask a question about the latency? Yes, okay. Uh, do you mind go back to the last slide? Right. Go, uh, so we've got a question going back to the last slide. Uh, when uh, in the two-stage pipeline uh, scenario, isn't that when the pipeline starts running, we will get a new output every 25 nanosecond from C? Yes, exactly. So when... So, yeah, yeah. why is that you, you define latency as 50? Right, okay. So, question was, if we get an output every 25 nanoseconds from C, why is the latency defined as 50, right? Um, sorry, I have to repeat this because we've got a few different um, streams going out, yeah. so I need to copy it over. Right, um, so, remember our definition of latency and throughput. The throughput... is defined as we've got various inputs. I1 produces O1, we've got I2 produces O2, we've got I3 produces O3. The throughput is this time here, the time between outputs, throughput, right? The latency is the time taken to get from input to output. So we've got the latency here. Right? So in this circuit, the time between outputs will be the clock frequency. Every clock cycle, a new piece of data will go from A of X and B of X 
through to C of X, and so every 25 nanoseconds we will get a new piece of data come out at C of X. However, the latency is the time from our input X becoming available to our the corresponding C of X becoming available, right? So what will happen if we say at T equals zero, um, X becomes available. Actually, X is valid. One clock cycle later, T equals T clock, which equals 25 nanoseconds. A of X and B of X are valid because that's the time at which the output of A is copied through the register to produce RA of X, right? And similarly, it's the time at which the output of B is copied through the register to give us our B of X as an input to C. Then I'm just going to skip over this block of text, so I'm going to do it down here. At T equals 2 TCLK, which equals 50 nanoseconds, C of X becomes valid. So at 25 nanoseconds, again, I'm just using nanoseconds because it's easier to say, but it could be milliseconds, it could be picoseconds, it could be anything. Um, so at 25 nanoseconds, A of X and B of X are, regi um, are ready because they've been copied through the registers. 25 nanoseconds later, the output becomes of C becomes available and ready, and it's copied through the register to produce C of X, okay? And so, because we've gone through two clock cycles in our circuit, each clock cycle taking 25 nanoseconds, our latency has been 50 nanoseconds, because that's the time for one particular input, X, to propagate all the way through our output, um, through our circuit, and get to the output. Does that answer your question, Zaran? Yeah, I uh, get it, the difference of the uh, latency and throughput. Uh, why is the latency of the two-stage pipeline is the 25 multiplied by 2, but not 45? Um, so the reason that we it's 25 multiplied by 2 is because we assume that our input becomes available on a clock edge, right? What we assume is that back here, there is another register which is copying, um, which is making X available. So, the, um, X must become available on one clock edge, and therefore it must be 25 nanoseconds before it can get to the output of this register or this register. Because what we see is that the X spends 15 nanoseconds getting through A, and then it waits here at the output of A for 10 nanoseconds. Like we saw with our laundry, with our washer, it spent 45 minutes washing, and then it spent 15 minutes waiting for the dryer to be ready. The same thing is happening here. We've got 15 nanoseconds to get through A, then a 10 nanosecond wait. We've got 20 nanoseconds to get through B, and then a 5 nanosecond wait until that clock edge is ready, until we're allowed to put our data through our register, out of our washer and into our dryer, so to speak. And then it takes 25 nanoseconds to get through C, and then get copied through the register. Right. Uh, question from Varun. Scott, by observation, can latency be defined by T clock times number of pipeline registers in the critical path? Exactly, Varun. You've got, um, you've just stated something which is on a later slide. So, yes, you are correct. Right? Um, so that's why I said T clock times K, where K, um, is two in this case because it's a two-stage pipeline. The number of stages is defined by the number of registers in the critical path, which is the same as the number of registers in any path due to a specific convention. Okay? Uh, does that answer your question, Ziran?
Yes, thank you. Because the C and B has a、uh, five minutes time difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the unpipeline scenario is just purely combinational, and the pipeline version is sequential logic. Uh yes, a mix. Uh, the pipeline version is a mixture of、uh, sequential and combinational logic. Yes. Thank you. Brilliant. Right. Okay. So we've got our. So we're looking back to our pipeline diagrams. Um. We see that, at, the start of clock cycle i. So, this will be our t equals zero point. This will be t equals t c l k. This will be t equals two t c l k. So each of these lines t equals three t c l k. Obviously, t c l k means the clock period, right? At the start of clock cycle i, so at t equals zero, x i becomes available on x, and then from there. Over some period of time, the A and B units process the data, and then on the next clock edge, it gets copied over to A reg and B reg, and then that A reg and B reg, over some period of time, make it available, and then on the second clock cycle, it gets copied. Out to C reg, right? However, while the C logic is working on A of x of i、um, and B x i, at the same time A and B are working on x i plus one, right? So A and B. Are working on data item i plus one, while C is working on data item i. And then we've copied C of x of、um, C of x i over. We copy A and B of x i over, and so C starts working on data item i plus one. This data item here, while A and B are working on data item i plus two, and at the same time, C of x of i is available. It's valid for whatever logic is downstream. So this will probably then go through another piece of logic called D into a register. Etc. So that C of x of i is available for a whole clock cycle to whatever is downstream of our specific piece of logic, right? And that's why we define our x of i to become available at the rising clock edge, because most likely it's being driven by a register further upstream, right? So we can always see that we've got two pieces of data in flight at any one time. With one piece of data、um, available on our output after two clock cycles. So from here, you can see that the time to ta taken from this becoming available.、Oh, let's just change colours here to make this a bit clearer. The time from any input becoming available to it becoming available at its output is going to be two t clock. That's our latency, but the time between、um, outputs is just t clock, and this two here is because we've got a two-stage pipeline, right? So conventions when we are defining pipelines, we define a k stage pipeline or a k pipeline as an acyclic circuit. That means that you can't have data going round in a loop. This is not allowed.
that's not allowed. It can only be data going forwards through the pipeline. It must have exactly K registers. So that's what you were saying, Farron, where it's the clock period times the number of pipeline registers in the critical path. That's exactly K registers on every path, right? We're not allowed a situation where we have one path, which has got two registers, and another path, which has only got one register. That's not allowed. We must have, let's draw this slightly separately. We must have the same number of registers on each path. Okay. Right. Um, by this definition, a combinational circuit, a purely combinational circuit, is a zero stage pipeline because there are no registers on every path. Right. Every pipeline stage is considered to have a register on its output, not on its input. So if we look back at this circuit here, we see this is one stage of a pipeline. This is another stage of a pipeline. This is a parallel, um, is a stage which is parallel to this stage. There's no register on the input, but there is a register on the output. This is a convention. We could do it the other way around, but it's easier to work with things if we put the registers at the outputs. Okay? So by convention, the register is at the output, not at the input. Any register at the input is associated with the output of the previous stage. So we've defined it like this. Obviously, there is a register at the input C, but that's actually a register of the output of the previous stage, not the input of this stage. Again, it's convention, right? This is just how we define it. We must make sure that the clock signal is common to all registers, right? And it has a period, T clock, sufficient to cover the propagation delay over any combinational path plus the um, input registers delay plus the setup time. So in other words, whatever the longest delay is from the clock of one register to the clock of another register, that is um, the uh, clock frequency. Bearing in mind that that includes the TCQ and the TSU, the propagation delay of the register and the setup time of the register, must be included in this, right? Because it's from clock to clock. The latency of a K pipeline is going to be however many stages you've got times the clock frequency. Because what you've got is you've got your um, data coming in at t equals zero, at clock cycle zero, on the positive end. Two registers? That seems like a two pipeline so far. Let's take the middle path. Oh. That one's only got one. There isn't any. There is no value of K for which you can say this circuit is a K pipeline because we are mixing pieces of data, right? Q is taking P of X of I because there's no register in there, but also X of I plus one, right? Okay, um, okay, it seems some people aren't able to see the slide. Um, it appears to be working from my end, but OBS did complain a moment ago. Um, so I'm wondering whether there's something up with that. Um, this one seems to be working here. Uh, Right, um, I'm just going to draw a smiley face on this to make sure. Oops. 
that you can see. That doesn't look much like a smiley face. Um, can all of you see that? Right, so Ziran can't seem to see it at the moment. Um, and Farron can see slide 11. Um, no smiley. Okay. I am going to momentarily disconnect and then reconnect just to be sure. Okay. Um, just going to leave session momentarily. Right, okay. Can you all see it at the moment then? Yup. Yup. Right. Um, I'm going to draw another smiley face on here. Just to make sure everyone can see it. Right, okay. I'm going to assume that it's working now and we shall continue. Um, just check that one. Yep, that one's still working. Good, right. Okay, um, so, as I was saying, um, the problem here is that we've got different inputs having different paths through. So we've got, um, at our queue, we're processing P of X of I, so we've got our X of I has gone straight through P and to Q, but we're also looking at X of I plus 1, right? Because this one, it stopped at the register and then went through on the next clock cycle. So we've got different pieces of data interfacing at Q, right? Because there's some paths which have two registers and some that only have one. This is not a well-formed K pipeline. We can't do this. We must have a register here. Okay? So that's an ill-formed pipeline, don't do that. Make sure that there is always the same number of registers on every single path. So how do we make sure that we've designed a pipeline correctly? Right, so make sure to focus your attention on placing the pipelining registers around the slowest circuit elements because these are the critical paths they're the bottlenecks they're what going to what are going to define your clock frequency um i'd like to point out in this circuit c is our bottleneck c is the slowest element in the entire circuit and so that's the one that we need to focus on right so first thing draw our circuit in such a way that you can define a direction to it so notice how in this circuit all the data is travelling that way, right? So we've got our inputs on the left, our outputs on the right, and everything is moving left to right. You could do this like right to left if you want. Um, most people expect to see a circuit drawn left to right, and so if you draw it the other way around, you're going to confuse them very heavily. So... Um, so your clock frequency is going to be dependent on the, um, on the longest path between any two registers is going to be how you define your clock frequency, right? It's the longest path between any two registers. So we'll see that in a moment, right? And then what we do, draw a node at the top, a node at the bottom, and then draw a line between them that doesn't cut through combinational logic 
but instead cuts through some of the wires between them. Right? Every time it cuts through a wire, put a register. Right? And then that has added a stage to your pipeline and that line effectively defines a stage. So if I draw an extra one on the start of here, so we can see we've got one stage which is enclosed by this um, area here, right? Remember at the start we said that um, registers should be attached to outputs and so we've got our register our, at our output and this is now a one pipeline. Okay, well obviously we want to reduce, so if we look at the maximum delay through this circuit, uh, the worst delay is going to be 4 plus 3 plus 8 plus 5, so that's 7, 15, so this is 20 nanoseconds. Our clock frequency will be um, 50 megahertz here. Let's make it a bit better. We'll draw another line, cutting off um, a bit more logic. Really, we want to draw lines around the longest path that is currently present in our circuit. So at the moment, um, this C is our longest element, so we want to draw lines around C. So we're going to draw a line to the right of C, so we're putting registers at the output of C, and then obviously because we've drawn a line through here and through here, we're going to put registers there as well. We're going to do another one at the input of C. So we're going to put a register here. And then following the line down, we're going to put a register here. And so now what we've done is we've sectioned off C between two registers. The delay from this register to this register is 8 nanoseconds. The delay from this register to this register is 8 nanoseconds. This one's 4 nanoseconds. The longest delay in our circuit is 8 nanoseconds. So we can say T clock equals 8 nanoseconds. F clock equals 125 megahertz. We've gone from we look at here 20 nanoseconds and 50 megahertz up to 8 nanoseconds and 125 megahertz um, question is there no register between D and E we could put a register between D and E that would be entirely fine to do it that way so we could instead of drawing this line this way we could instead decide to go here oops here and round like that, right? In which case we would have a register here rather than a register here. And then in that case, we would have our longest path would be through C, which is eight nanoseconds, or through A, through D, to so this register here would also be eight nanoseconds. Which side of D we put it on doesn't really matter in this case. Um, but ideally, you want to make sure that if you've segregated um, an item of 8 nanoseconds off, try to keep the delay in this area at 8 nanoseconds as opposed to making it uh, making things outside 8 nanoseconds, right? Because if this one were 5 nanoseconds, and we put the line here, then we'd have this 9 nanoseconds path here, and our clock frequency wouldn't be as good. Okay? Is that reg different from the one near to F? Um, not particularly. Um, because we've got a T junction here, um, you can either have the register just here, in which case you only need one register, because you put your line here, or you could put the line here, at which point you would need two registers. Right? Obviously it's more efficient to just have one register, so it's better to have um, a register here than it is to have it here. But yeah, so with the one near F, um, 
basically because we've had to go through this line, um, we had to put a register there. Every time you draw a line, um, draw one of these cuts through the circuit, you have to put a register there, even if it means you end up with lots of registers with no logic between them, okay? So, yes, it is a different register to the one near F, right? But yeah, the reason we don't, the reason we're trying to put it round here instead is because we know that this critical path is 8 nanoseconds, so we want to try and keep as much delay inside this region without going over that 8 nanoseconds, so that if we've got other longer delays over here, it means that um, we don't end up reducing our clock frequency due to things over here and adding more registers, okay? So yeah, this example would be more if effective if this one said 5 nanoseconds, actually. Um, it might be something I should change, actually. Um, so... We put our registers at these intersection points where the cut of the graph um, meets one of the arcs of the graph. This set of registers is the minimum number of registers needed for the optimal pipelining of the circuit. You could draw a few other cuts through this, you won't get any fewer registers while maintaining your t-clock equals 8 nanoseconds, right? Um, you. One option would be to try and move this line over here, but if you did that, you'll have a you won't have this register here, and so you'll have four nanoseconds plus five nanoseconds. You'll have a nine nanosecond path, right? So that's why that path isn't very good. Why does it not cause a problem when there is no reg between D and E? Um, so. At the end of the day, you can cascade combinational logic. We had that in the previous slides, right? This is just as fine as having all these, right? There's no problem with having combinational logic cascaded. You just need to make sure that every single path through your circuit has the same number of registers. So if you look at the bottom path, we start off here at the input. We go through one register here. We go through another register here, and a register here. If we look at this middle path here, we go through one register, second register, third register, and out. If we look at the top path, we go through one register, two registers, three registers, and out. Every single path through this circuit has the same number of registers, and that's what we need in a pipeline. It doesn't matter if there's a hundred stages of combinational logic um, put in sequence, as long as there's always the same number of registers on every single path through your circuit. Right, um, could we maybe have a register that is before F? Yeah. Um, put before the junction of D and E. Yeah, so this is what I was saying earlier. So if I just draw this out, um, so we've got, there's the, there's D and the register. And then we were saying what happens if we put a register here and then we go through E. So we've got F, E, draw that there, draw that there, and then to this one's register. Just draw some of these arrows on to make it clear. Right, so question, what happens if we put the re this register here, over here, so it's here? Well, if we do that, because our cut, if I draw the cut on, because our cut is now going down here, round here, and down to the output node, we've n this register here gets removed. 4 nanoseconds, 5 nanoseconds, the delay 
through this path becomes 9 nanoseconds. So T clock must be greater than or equal to 9 nanoseconds and F clock must be less than or equal to 111.11 megahertz. Right? If we put the register here rather than here and here, we end up with a slower clock frequency because we've got a path from this register down here through E and F to this register, which is 9 nanoseconds long. So that's why you don't want to try using that path specifically. If you tried to then put a register here, you would have an unbalanced path. So from this one, one, two, three registers. Through this one, one, two, three, four registers. It wouldn't be a well-formed pipeline if you tried putting a register down here without putting a register up here, okay? So that's why we don't put the register over there. Um, our latency is a three-stage pipeline. It goes through three register stages, each of them eight nanoseconds long. And so our latency is 24 nanoseconds, okay? So in summary, pipelining, it allows us to increase the throughput by breaking up long combinational paths and hence increasing the flop. Uh, clock frequency. The disadvantages are that it increases the latency. It's only as good as the weakest link, so the slowest step, in this case C up here, um, constrains the system throughput. So if our slowest step is 8 nanoseconds, the maximum clock frequency will be 125 megahertz. There's no way to, di um, to change that. If our slowest step is 10 nanoseconds, our maximum clock frequency is 100 megahertz. We can't do any better than that. Also, increased area and increased power, right? We've added in registers. We've added in, right? Because we've added in registers, we've got more logic, and more logic consumes more power. And we've got a higher clock frequency. As we've got a higher clock frequency, our power goes up. Except, when we imagine, can you remember when we looked at our power lecture? We said, imagine you're consuming one milliwatt for one second, or you're consuming 10 milliwatts for 0 0.1 seconds, the energy, so we said obviously the power is higher because it's the peak, however, the energy of, bo of both these systems is the same. energy most likely is going to go down, right? So the energy taken to do all this processing, well, it's going to be whatever the combinational blocks were. Oh, I'm just checking. Yeah, that is working. Yeah. So it's going to be whatever the combinational blocks were, obviously. We're going to slightly increase the power because we've got these extra registers here, right? And the higher clock frequency. But because our circuit is processing more data per each unit of time, the time our circuit has to be switched on decreases. And so all the extra stuff is going to decrease, right? So all the other parts of our circuit, which are sat there doing nothing, can be turned off after a certain amount of time, um, after a shorter amount of time, and so we can have our energy quite often go down when we pipeline because our extraneous circuitry gets turned off quicker.
right? Um, an example of this, um, a, a very real example in fact, um, anyone who ever does uh, intro to computer, ar uh, sorry not intro to computer architecture, advanced computer architecture will hear this one. Um, in the ARM processor, the guys who are trying to optimize the power of the floating point unit are actually trying to make it faster to pipeline it much better because if they um, reduce the amount of time that the chip is on and processing floating point instructions, they can reduce the power consumed by the other units in the circuit, and hence they can reduce the overall power consumption, right? Their floating point unit actually doesn't cost that much energy. But by making their floating point unit bigger, by increasing the power that it consumes, they can reduce the time the chip runs for, and then hence they can turn the entire chip off for, um, chip off much quicker, and so they can reduce the overall power and energy consumption, right? So it's always important to bear in mind that maybe you're increasing your area and power when you just look at your circuit, but when you consider the entire um, device as a whole, the entire package, maybe making your chip faster with pipelining will reduce um, the overall power and energy consumption, right? So that is pipelining. Um, next lecture, um, keep that one. Uh, where is the next lecture? We don't have it here. Next lecture is memories, right, yeah. So next lecture we're looking at memories. So we're going to look at our SRAM and DRAM cells. Next lecture. Um, oh, next lecture um, is not um, on Friday. I made a mistake. Um, Friday is a bank holiday um, in the UK. So there's no lecture next Friday. Um, so sorry, this Friday. Um, the 8th, so our next lecture will be on the 12th. Um, any questions just to wrap this up? Yes, sir. Uh, can you show how is the latency calculated in the last example? Uh, in this one, you say? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, I'm just going to add in a slide momentarily, and I'm going to... No, I can't seem to get areas. Copy that, dump it on this slide. Right, um, and I'm actually not going to move the whole lot to the center. Right, um, and then shift F5 that. Right, um, so, um, how do we calculate the latency? Right. Latency, uh, pen, red, right. So, um, at t equals zero, data comes in here, right? X and Y become valid, right? T equals T clock. Our data is ready here, it's been waiting here at, for one nanoseconds, right? And it's copied over through this register, right? So we can say this one, uh, we'll call this node 1, node 2, yep, node 1 and node 2 become valid. Right, so at t equals t clock, which equals 8 nanoseconds, n1 just here, and n2 just here become valid, because we have to wait for a full clock cycle before we can copy through these registers. So this one takes 4 nanoseconds to go through, and then it waits around for 4 nanoseconds. Okay, comparatively this one takes 7 nanoseconds to go through and waits for 1 nanosecond. Right? Then, um, it takes 8 nanoseconds to go through here, 
it takes four nanoseconds to go through here and it waits around for four nanoseconds it takes eight nanoseconds to go through here and so at t equals 2 tclk n3 n4 and n5 n3 m4 m5 all become valid because the data is copied from the input of these registers to their outputs right t equals 2 t c l k which is 16 nanoseconds then from each of these registers it takes 5 nanoseconds to get through here 5 n s then they sit around at the input of this register for 3 nanoseconds. And so at t equals 3 t c l k. Our output z becomes valid because on that clock cycle data is copied from the input to the output of the final register. 3TCLK is 24 nanoseconds. So from XI and YI become valid, becoming valid, to ZI becoming valid, so for a particular data item I, it takes 24 nanoseconds to get from the input to the output, and that's why it is our latency right and then if you were looking at the throughput well you would see that at t equals 4 t c l k z i plus 1 is valid right the time of z i plus 1 minus the time at which z i are valid right so this is the time at which each of these two are valid for i plus 1 and i equals 8 nanoseconds which equals um, 1 over the throughput right our throughput is 1 by 8 gigahertz which equals 125 megahertz Right, that's our throughput. Okay. Then quickly hide that one. So does that answer your question about how the throughput is calculated? Yeah, right. But in general, the easiest to remember it to remember is that for a K pipeline. Right, latency equals k times t c l k, and our throughput equals one over t c l k. Right. And that's that. Ugh, any other questions? No? Okay. Um, I'll end the lecture there for today then. Um, no lecture on Friday. I will see you next Tuesday the 12th at uh, 1 o'clock GMT, which obviously convert to your local time zone or just look at the... Um, calendar invites I sent out. Um, have fun! Right, stop recording and session. Stop recording and leave session. Very good.
Hi Scott, can I ask one more question? Oh, hang on. Uh, yes, yes, quick question. Uh, why is the throughput 1 over TCLK, not just a TCLK? Uh, so we define the throughput. Um, so basically what we want to say is that the throughput becomes higher as the clock um, period becomes lower, right? So if you imagine, if we go, in fact, if we go back to, uh, where's that goods? Let's just put one here. Um, and shift F5 this. Right, um, and let's present a view. Right, so imagine you've got some processes which take some amount of time, right? We don't have any pipelining. So this takes uh, three, that takes one, and that takes two. The throughput is going, well, it's going to take six time instances to get from here to here. And so our throughput is going to be one item per six time instances, right? So we're going to say one by six. If we pipeline this, right, um, well, our clock frequency is going to be three time instances because the um, longest path between two registers is this three at the start. So, right, and we're going to get one piece of data out every clock cycle. So our throughput is one item per clock cycle, which equals one item per three time instances, which is one third. So as we reduce our clock frequency, I'm sorry, our clock period, as we reduce the time between two registers, our throughput goes up, right? And so that's why our throughput is 1 divided by the clock period. Or in other words, our throughput is equal to F clock, right? Because we get one item out every clock cycle. Does that answer that question? Yep. Yeah. So normally in a pipeline, um... Uh, if we um, de decrease the um, the period of the clock t mm -hmm. clock, mm -hmm. um, sorry, let me say that again. Uh, if we increase the clock frequency, which is decrease the the uh, the period of the clock, mm -hmm. that is not okay, right? Because TCLK must be um, greater than the, the the critical path delay. Yes, yeah. So we want to increase it as much as possible, but we are limited by our critical path, right? And so we, uh, we up our F clock and we decrease our T clock to the limit of our critical path, at which point we say, can we split our critical path into multiple different sections, which are each shorter? Okay, so if we actually uh, increase the T clock, it, it, it's fine. If we increase our T clock, yes, that'll be fine. So if we just said, run slower. Yeah, so the whole thing will just run slower. The throughput will be lower. The latency will be higher. It's not a good thing to increase it, but we can. Yeah. Okay, but if we increase that, we will run into a problem called negative worst slug. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so if we have a, so if we say our clock period, say we set our clock period to two nanoseconds, we would say, okay, um, I'm just going to put a register here to make it easy to see, but we've got a register, it takes three nanoseconds to get to here, but what happens is we get our first clock edge over here get our next clock edge sometime later, so zero nanoseconds, that happens at two nanoseconds. 
then our data becomes available at three nanoseconds. And so what we've ended up with is we've got a setup time violation, right? If that's our setup time, our data needs to become valid back here, right? Not over here, which is what we've got. Because we've um, reduced our clock frequency too much, our setup time has been violated. Our data is coming becoming available after the setup time started. And then this time period here, from and then um, from the setup time to the data becoming available is what we call the slack, right? So normally we've got something called positive slack because we've got our clock edge, we've got our data become available, our setup time is here, and then this is called positive slack, plus V slack, right? Positive slack is fine. It means that you can increase your clock frequency if you want, and you'll be able to make your circuit go faster. On the other hand, in this circuit here, right, we've got something called negative slack. What that means is that your data is becoming available after your setup time starts. We've got negative slack. and your circuit just won't work. And so what you need to do is you need to increase your clock frequency, move this edge to the right until your slack, slack becomes zero or positive, okay? Does that answer the question about slack? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Thank you. Right. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. I will see you next lecture then. Bye.